In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Amen. I'd like to welcome you to our conversation that we have on the sower. We've got 12 programs we're giving on the liturgy, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. This will be our third. But as always, we like to start off our conversation by inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of the church. And Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. When we pray the Hail Holy Queen, we cry out to Mary as our life our sweetness and our hope. Therefore, let's beg Mary to help us to love and appreciate more the liturgy and the holy sacrifice of the Mass, which is the greatest of all prayers. Let's pray. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And bless the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Pray for our sinners. Now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now we'd like to invite to be with us our spiritual director. What a privilege to have as our spiritual director the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has many titles. The Holy Spirit is known as the Paraclete. He's also known, taken from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, as the gift of gifts. Holy Spirit is also known as from the sequest, sequence on Pentecost, <clears throat> the sweet guest of our souls. Also the Holy Spirit is our, our counselor as well as our consoler. And very important, the Holy Spirit is our interior master. St. Paul reminds us with these words in Romans chapter 8. We don't know how to pray as we ought, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans so that we can say, Abba. Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's beg the Holy Spirit to pour light into our minds and to set our hearts on fire with love for God and for our neighbor. As you pray, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and enkindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. Thou shalt know the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us that by the same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, 
as it was in beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. O Lady Guadalupe, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael the Archangel, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Ignatius of Loyola, pray for us. St. Francis Xavier, pray for us. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. For my friends, to encourage you, all of you, as we talk once again about the liturgy, the Mass, following up on what is called the liturgical cycle, to encourage you, I will be praying for all of you in my Mass today. And of course, the Mass is the greatest of all prayers, which we praise God the Father by the offering of God the Son and through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's right. That's the purpose of Holy Mass, to praise God the Father by the offering of God the Son and through the power of the Holy Spirit. My first intention will be that all of us will try to be docile to the Holy Spirit all the days of our lives. Perhaps this can be the prayer that you repeat frequently during the course of this day. And that prayer is, Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. I repeat, Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come through the heart of Mary. My second intention, I'd like to pray for you and your families that as a result of the power of the Mass, that our families would be converted, they will be purified, they will be sanctified, your family members will grow in holiness, and at the end that they will be saved. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ expressed it in these words, What would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his immortal soul? My last intention will be I would like to pray for the, for the dying that through our prayers and this holy sacrifice of the Mass, that those who are dying, they would open up their hearts to God's infinite mercy and they will be saved. It's true, there is a lot of sin out there. St. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, where sin abounds, the mercy of God abounds all the more. So let's pray, my friends, for deathbed sinners that they would turn to God and be saved for all eternity. Let's place them on the altar in the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Amen. So, in our conversation and 
radio program Sower. They've asked me to give several talks, and we've decided to talk on the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. I'd like to start off with the story of a saint related to the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And this saint was a Maronite monk. A Maronite monk. And his name was Father Charbel McClough. This saint was endowed with great mystical gifts, a life of great penance, a life of great love for the for the sick and the poor. But most especially, he loved the topic that we're talking about. He loved the holy sacrifice of the Mass. For Father Charbel, the very heart of his life was the holy sacrifice of the Mass, as it should be for you and for me. Being a monk in a monastery and having vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, he asked the superior if it would be possible for him to celebrate the holy sacrifice of the Mass at midday. at midday. And this is the reason, is that he understood that Mass was so important that he wanted to celebrate the Mass with the best of dispositions. So he was given permission to celebrate the Mass at 12 noon so that he could spend the whole morning in preparation for the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Then after Mass, he would spend the rest of the day rendering thanksgiving to God for the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And by the way, the word Eucharist actually means, it means Thanksgiving. And we're not able to carry that out exactly because we have our our obligations. But the whole idea of St. Charbel McClough, as we talk about the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, is that the graces that come from Mass are abundant. The graces that come from the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass are infinite. Because it's the Opus Dei, the work of God. Christ offering himself to God the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit. In theology, there is a theological principle and it's called dispositive grace. With respect to receiving the sacraments, the graces we receive from the sacraments are in direct proportion to our disposition. So the better the preparation the more full the participation, the more fervent the reception of the Eucharist, and the more ardent the thanksgiving, then the more abundant graces will descend upon us. Will descend upon us.
St. John Yudes said this. One Mass. One Mass, it wouldn't be sufficient all of eternity to prepare for one Mass and all eternity to give thanksgiving for one Mass. Wow. So encouraging all of you to go deeper in your knowledge and love for the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So what I'd like to do is I'd just like to rewind the film and briefly go through what we've already learned just to refresh our memories. Feel that we're building a 12-story edifice as we explain the Mass, the liturgy, and we're explaining the liturgical cycle now. Two weeks ago, my friends, I explained what are the basic conditions to receive the Eucharist well. The basic conditions that are required to receive the Eucharist well are three. We want to receive the Eucharist, Holy Communion, worthily. We said that we shouldn't just say, I'm going to go up and get the bread but rather we say, I'm going to receive Holy Communion. Make sure that we have proper vocabulary in the way we speak about God and His Church and His liturgy. The first condition is faith and belief. No one should receive the Eucharist if they don't know what it is and if they do not have faith and belief that the Eucharist is truly and substantially the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. That's why you have two years of preparation for First Communion so that those that receive the Eucharist will really understand and believe. True, we should always grow in our faith and say, Lord, strengthen my faith. The second condition is that we have to fast. The Eucharistic fast now is one hour before receiving Holy Communion. You can drink water, you can take medicine, and elderly people, sick people, are dispensed from the Eucharistic fast, as well as those who are attending the sick and the elderly. The third condition to receive the Eucharist, Holy Communion, fruitfully, efficaciously, would be we have to be in the state of grace. Therefore, if you're aware of having committed a mortal sin, there are three conditions, grave matter, full knowledge, and full will. For example, if you miss Mass on Sunday purposely yesterday, then you would have to recourse to the sacrament confession. Otherwise, you're running the risk of receiving communion sacrilegiously. If you read 1 Corinthians 11, St. Paul speaks about eating and drinking of the body and blood of Christ toward your own condemnation. So we want to make sure that we're well prepared to receive the Eucharist. All right. So before moving into the liturgical year, this is what we're talking about. We're going through the liturgical cycle, the liturgical year, where Jesus comes to us in word and sacrament. 
the liturgical year, the cycle that repeats itself. On Sundays, there are actually three cycles, letter A, B, and C. A, we read Matthew. B, we read Mark. And C, we read Luke. So we're in cycle A right now, we're reading the Gospel of St. Saint, Saint Matthew. But I'd like to summarize for you a very important number from a church document. And it's taken from the documents of Vatican II. My friends, the four most important documents of the Second Vatican Council they're called dogmatic constitutions, are the following. Sacro Santa Concilium, De Verbum, Gaudium et Spes, and Lumen Gentium. These are called the four dogmatic constitutions of Vatican II, which are the four most important documents from the Second Vatican Council. So Sacramento Concilium is the dogmatic constitution, my friends, on the sacred liturgy. That refers to the, the Mass, the Liturgy of the Hours, the Eucharist, Holy Communion, priests, ministers. So I'd like to summarize for you Sacrosanta Concilium number seven. In this number, Sacrosanta Concilium number seven the Church expresses, within the context of the Mass itself, the various ways that God makes Himself present. So let's go through them. First, in the assembly that comes together, Christ makes himself present, calling to mind these words of Jesus Christ. Where two or more are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. Those are the words of Christ. Where two or more are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. Second, God makes himself present through his word. Every time the holy sacrifice of the Mass is celebrated on Sundays, there are three readings and the responsorial psalm. So when the word of God is being read, That's exactly what it is. The best definition, my friends, I believe, of the Bible is the Bible is the Word of God. That's why Sacrosanctum Concilium also says that we should participate in the holy sacrifice of the Mass fully, actively, and consciously. I'd like to repeat that. This is one of the key concepts of Sacrosanta Concilium, the dogmatic constitution and the liturgy. We should all participate in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, fully, actively, and consciously. For that reason, coming late to the holy sacrifice of the Mass militates against participating fully, actively, and consciously. 
We should always try to arrive before Mass starts so that we can prepare ourselves, dispose ourselves for this greatest of actions of God in the world. We don't come late for an opera or for a baseball game or for a restaurant engagement or for a graduation, but how easy it is for us to arrive late for Mass, our encounter with God. Next, God speaks to us most especially through the Gospel. Of all the readings, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that the Gospels have a preeminence, a most prominent place. a preeminent, a most prominent place. My friends, in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, on Sunday, the Mass celebrated by the priest It can start out in procession. And the priest or the deacon can enter heading toward the altar with the Gospels elevated on high. That's very, very important. He's walking in procession toward the altar, symbolizing the fact that we are pilgrim people. Proceed by altar service with the two candles and the thurible or the incense. Then he places the Gospels on the altar. The altar is symbolic of the body of Christ. Then when the time for the reading of the Gospel, once again the Gospel, the book of the Gospel is elevated and processes to the ambon, where it will be proclaimed by the priest or the deacon. And on his light, right and on his left there are the altar servers holding the candles because Christ is the light of the world. Then the gospel is proclaimed, the Lord be with you and also with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew, glory to you, O Lord. And then the thurible with incense is used to incense the gospels. And you can see the white smoke ascending on high. Symbolic of God's presence. Symbolic of our prayers ascending on high. Then after the gospel is proclaimed, the priest or the deacon kisses the book of the gospels, showing the great reverence that we have for the word of God. So my friends, we're giving you an explanation today, my friends, of Sacrosanta Concilium number seven, where God becomes present for us in the liturgy, in the mass. So he's present in the, in the, in the word of God, but most especially he's present in the reading of the gospel in which we actually stand up for the gospel showing greater reverence for 
the gospel because that's when Jesus Christ, the word of the Father, will speak to us. How else? Does God speak to us? He speaks to us, my friends, in the context of the sacred litur liturgy through the person of the priest. There are many definitions you can give for the priest. St. Augustine gives us the the definition from Latin, alter, alter Christus, another Christ. The book of Hebrews, chapter 5, defines the priest as a man chosen by God, not by his own will, but chosen by God, to offer gifts and sacrifices to God for sins as well as for his own sins. That's the definition given chapter 5 in the letter to the Hebrews. So the priest is the kapus is the Latin word. He's the head. He's the president of the assembly of the holy sacrifice of the mass. And obviously, friends, I think you know, if you don't have a priest, you don't have a priest, then you don't have Mass. Lay people could celebrate a, the liturgy of the Word, but it's only the priest that can make real the whole essence of the Mass, the ordained priest. Let's move on. Another manifestation of the presence of God in the Mass is when the priest takes the bread and takes the wine he invokes the Holy Spirit that's called the Epiclesis and he repeats the same words that Jesus said at the Last Supper these are the words of consecration Without the words of consecration, then we don't have the Eucharist. So the priest has to take the bread and wine and say the words of Jesus Christ. Take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. Do this in memory of me. There you have the double consecration. So in that moment, maybe some of you have seen the movie, The Great Miracle. That moment you have the great miracle. You have that bread. It is turned into the body of Christ. The wine is turned into the blood of Christ. You have the great miracle. That would be the moment of consecration. Thanks be to Thomas Aquinas, we also have the technical word, it's called transubstantiation. So Jesus really becomes present in the Mass as a result of the consecration. Following that, we have communion. So, we arrived at communion, and that host that you received is truly 
the body, the blood, the soul, the divinity of Christ. For that reason, as I said earlier, to receive communion well, you have to have those three requirements. Believing in the real presence, your hour Eucharistic fast, and then being in the state of grace. Also, in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, Christ is present in song. St. Augustine goes on to point out that he who sings well prays twice. We should all become engaged in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass participating fully, actively, and consciously in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. So I've given you, my friends, a summary of one of the numbers of possibly the most important church document in the past 70 years. It's taken from Sacrosanctum Concilium and it's the dogmatic constitution and the sacred liturgy. So given that this is so very important, I'd just like to go through them again and we can move into, once again, the liturgical cycle. So my friends, Make a concerted effort to never arrive late for the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass so you can be well disposed. Remember the concept of dispositive grace. The better the preparation, the better the disposition, the more abundant the graces will descend upon us. So Christ makes himself present in the assembly in the praying community because he said where two or more are gathered in my name I am in their midst he's present in the reading of the word because the Bible my friends is the word of God Be our Father, we pray, give us this day our daily bread. May we have a real hunger for the word of God. As Jesus said to Satan, man does not live on bread alone, but every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. But most especially he's present then in the Gospels. How much we respect the Gospels. We walk up in procession we incense the gospel, we kiss the gospel, we stand up to hear the gospel because that's when Jesus Christ is truly speaking to us. Then present in the priest, the priest is alter Christus. The priest truly represents Christ. If you don't have an ordained priest, my friends, you don't have the mass. And then Christ truly becomes present. We call it the real presence. Christ truly becomes present, my friends, in the moment of consecration. In the moment of consecration. When the priest takes the bread and wine and he pronounces the words of Christ that he said at the Last Supper. Take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood. Do this in memory of me. 
Then you hear the altar server ringing the bell so that we're keenly aware that that moment Christ is truly coming to be with us. The Protestants believe in a symbolic presence. We believe in the real presence. And here's a technical word that if hopefully we'll be able to learn. Transubstantiation. Which comes from Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas. Transubstantiation. Then in communion. Finally, I said, this is important of sacred song in the liturgy, sacred liturgical song, in which the organ, even, even Gregorian chant, is given a certain prominence, we read in Vatican II. He who sings well prays twice. And finally, I'd like to add one more dimension of how Christ is present in our churches in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Christ is also present after the consecration, after Holy Communion, he's present in the tabernacle. The church teaches that the tabernacle is God's house. We know that Jesus is present in that little house called the tabernacle because nearby you're going to see a red vigil lamp which is extinguished only Holy Thursday night, Good Friday and Holy Saturday because that's when our Lord dies for us. But aside from the Easter Triduum that red vigil lamp should be burning bright always. Should be burning bright always. Now in that tabernacle you have what is called the ciborium or plural ciboria. The ciborium, the ciboria is the place where the consecrated hosts are present. The church teaches that that tabernacle serves especially for two primary purposes. Number one is that after Mass the priest, the deacon, or the Eucharistic ministers can take from the tabernacle, the ciborium, some of the sacred host to bring the sacred host to those who are unable to go to the holy sacrifice of the mass. The elderly, the sick, the paralytics, the hospitalized, so that they will have the privilege to be able to receive the Eucharist outside the context of the Mass because of their physical condition. But there's another reason why we have the tabernacle and the hosts. And that is so that we can come to visit Jesus. We can come to visit Jesus. He himself invites us. Jesus invites us in these words. Come to me, all of you who are weary, 
and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am meek and humble of heart. For you will find rest for your souls. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus invites us. Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 to 30. Come to me, all of you who are weary and find life burdensome, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, because I am meek and humble of heart. Because you will find rest for your souls. Because my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So we are invited to come before Mass or after Mass to come and to visit the Lord. Jesus is the best, the best of all friends. One of the four first short poems I learned related to the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, but especially related to visiting Christ in his tabernacle, was the following. Whenever I see a church, I stop to make a visit. So that when I die, the Lord will not say, who is it? Whenever I see a church, I stop to make a visit. So that when I die, the Lord will not say, who is it? So my friends, last week we introduced you to what is called the liturgical year. The liturgical cycle. The church new year always starts, my friends, with Advent. With Advent. Advent comes from Latin Adventire. In the season of Advent, which lasts four Sundays. The liturgical color for Advent is purple. Aside from when we're celebrating certain feast days, like the Immaculate Conception in Our Lady Guadalupe, then the priest comes out in white. During the Mass on Sunday, the Gloria is not said until the Christmas vigil, then we sing out the Gloria with the angels and with the shepherds. We proclaim the great glory of the birthday of Christ. Advent also, the church, speaks about the coming of Christ. I spent a lot of time today speaking about the coming of Christ in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. But also, also the Church speaks about three different times in which Christ comes to us. This is a highlight of the teaching of the Church in Advent. Christ comes to us in three different times. First, Christ came to us historically. About 2,000 years ago, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was born for us in the stable of Bethlehem. 
that is a historical reality that you can read in your Bible in Luke chapter 2. The second coming of Christ. The experts in the liturgy speak about the second coming of Christ will be at the end of time. At the end of time. We don't know the day nor the hour. But constantly our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the liturgy, in the Mass, in the Gospel says, Be prepared. Be prepared because we know neither the day nor the hour, but rather he will come like a thief in the night, as in the time of Noah. And finally, our Lord comes constantly he comes to us by means of grace. Pius Parsh years ago wrote works on the presence of Christ coming to us through grace. How does he come through grace? Especially, especially through the holy sacrifice of the Mass. So remember that, the coming of Christ. The word Emmanuel. The word Emmanuel actually means God with us. Christ came 2,000 years ago. Christ. Christ will come at the end of the world, but Christ is coming right now. And I mentioned the various different presences of Christ. every time the Mass is celebrated. In the assembly, in the reading of the Word of God, in the Gospel, in the presence of the priest, in the consecration, in Holy Communion, in the assembly that sings with joy, Augustine, he who sings well prays twice. Finally, Jesus, his last words before Jesus ascended into heaven were, out, were go out to all nations. Teach them what I taught you and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And behold, I am with you always, even until the end of time. Christ is present in his church, he is present in his priests, but Christ is also present in the tabernacle. My friends, not only should we go to Mass, but we should come to visit the Lord. Our church our church is open open every day at 4.45 in the morning. Closes every day at 8 p.m. Why? Because we're, invite, we're inviting you people to come. So not only can you come for the greatest of all prayers, the Opus Dei, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, but also that you can come 
invited by Jesus himself in these words. Come to me, all of you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am meek and humble of heart. For you will find rest for your souls. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My friends were spending several talks every Monday on the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Let us thank God that we believe in the Real Presence. Let us live out the word Eucharist. The word Eucharist comes from Greek. It means Thanksgiving. Let us thank God for the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Let us participate in the holy sacrifice of the Mass from the words of Sacrosanta Concilium. Let us participate fully, actively, and consciously in the greatest of all prayers, the Opus Dei, the work of God, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. In the words of the psalmist, we conclude, give thanks to the Lord for his good, for his mercy endures forever. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.